I'm Coach Caitlin. Welcome to Modern Access, where we explore innovations that make an inaccessible world a little better. I have a potentially life-threatening allergy to tree nuts, and we'll be talking about the essential item I never leave home without, AviQ. Before I get into that, though, let's learn a little bit about food allergies. According to FAIR, which stands for Food Allergy Research and Education, 32 million Americans have a food allergy. Someone visits an emergency room every three minutes for an allergic reaction to food. These reactions are called anaphylaxis and they're life-threatening. Anaphylaxis can also be caused by other things besides food, for example, in people who are allergic to latex, bee stings, or medications. The symptoms of anaphylaxis include trouble swallowing or breathing, nausea or vomiting, hives, itchy nose or mouth, an anxious feeling, and a loss of consciousness. Someone who's experiencing a severe allergic reaction needs to be given epinephrine right away because it can progress very quickly. Epinephrine is the drug that halts the symptoms of anaphylaxis. It's a temporary but life-saving measure meant to keep the airway open until the person can reach hospital. Some people try using Benadryl, but that can actually mask the symptoms while a severe reaction continues to affect the person's body. They're still in danger and they need epinephrine. Epinephrine comes in liquid form, and it's packaged in a device called an auto-injector. Yep, that means a needle. The person can often inject it themselves, but a child might not be able to. Neither would a person that has lost consciousness. Because of its temporary nature, a person with an allergy always has to carry two doses of epinephrine, two auto-injectors, all the time. The most well-known epinephrine auto-injector is the EpiPen. EpiPens have been making headlines lately, not because of their life-saving properties, but because of their high cost. That wasn't news to me, though. A two-pack of EpiPens costs hundreds of dollars. And to make matters worse, they have an expiration date, so hopefully you don't ever have to use it, but you still have to continue to buy replacements. Additionally, a shortage was announced in 2018, and that is still ongoing at the time of this recording. Luckily, there are some alternatives to the EpiPen. One is the generic EpiPen that's by the same manufacturer, Pfizer. This model is also affected by the shortage, though. Another auto-injector is Adrenoclick. Adrenoclick was once discontinued, but it's currently being manufactured and it's available. Adrenoclick has a pen-like shape, just like the EpiPen, and it still runs upwards of $100 for its generic version, according to GoodRx. Simjepi is a cost-effective alternative, but it comes with a significant drawback. Simjepi is not an auto-injector. With an auto-injector, the needle is concealed inside the device and the user should never really see it. Simjepi is a syringe. The user has to insert the needle manually into their thigh. That makes it a lot more difficult to do correctly, especially in the high-pressure situation that is anaphylaxis. In my opinion, the epinephrine that's the most cost-effective and easiest to use is the AviQ auto-injector. AviQ doesn't have the pen shape of Adrenoclick and EpiPen. Instead, it's a flat, rectangular prism the size of a credit card. AviQ speaks instructions out loud in a calm but firm voice. If having an allergic emergency, pull red safety guard down and off of AviQ. AviQ also makes the only epinephrine auto-injector that's FDA-approved for use on infants. And in a twist that seems too good to be true, patients can get AviQ for no out-of-pocket cost. Yep, it's totally free, even if your insurance doesn't cover it. If you don't have commercial insurance, the manufacturer, Kaleo, offers a patient assistance program to provide AviQ at no cost to patients that are experiencing financial hardship. A disclaimer on their website does mention that we don't know when this offer is going to end and they can choose to stop it at any time, but for now at least, it's exciting to have an easy to use, conveniently sized epinephrine auto injector that's accessible to everybody. My food allergy diagnosis really changed my life, but AviQ did make things a little better. I 
had my first allergy test and was diagnosed with a tree nut allergy when I was 16 years old. I knew about it much sooner, but I wasn't diagnosed and I didn't fully understand the severity until I was 16. My first allergic reaction that I can remember happened when I was really young, probably about three years old. I was hanging out in my great aunt's hair salon and I tried a cashew for the first time. I used to eat peanut M&Ms from the candy machine there, so no one really questioned it. It seemed like it would be uneventful. In reality, that is a feeling that I have never been able to shake. Nausea. A burning, itchy feeling in my mouth that's really hard to describe. I referred to it as the cashew feeling when I was a child and even into my teenage years. I just had a feeling that something bad was going to happen. I just generally felt really bad. As an adult, I call that what it is, anxiety. I asked for my grandpa to come pick me up and take me home. After that, and one other incident around the same time, I just learned to not eat cashews. Over time, I learned about allergies and what tree nuts were, and I wouldn't eat them. I would ask people, does this have nuts? And they would respond, are you allergic to nuts? Uh, never mind. I just avoided that snack. My pediatrician thought it was impossible for me to be allergic to them since I only had mild symptoms. Still, I just had a gut feeling. Fast forward to junior year of high school. I continued trying not to eat tree nuts and nothing else huge had happened really. I got an itchy mouth from eating a Subway cookie that had walnuts in it that I didn't know about. I got hives from a soap. I have asthma and eczema and that's basically something that makes you very, very itchy. And both were getting worse. I also was starting to have stomach problems. These symptoms were attributed to stress by several doctors. Eventually, it was decided that I would finally have the allergy test. Two arms full of tiny needle sticks later, I had an answer. By the way, if you ever have to do that test, don't be afraid. It feels kind of like if you poke yourself with a mechanical pencil. The cashew and pistachio dots had swelled to cover my inner elbows, encroaching on the circles where the other samples were. Those were my most severe allergens, with mild swelling on the samples of almonds and pecans. The validation felt really good for about a minute. From there, it was just a lot of confusion, awkward conversations whenever food was involved, and of course there was fear. Might I add that that was the week of Thanksgiving? My mom and I went to pick up my EpiPens that night. I felt kind of sick with them sitting there on the dinner table while I was trying to eat. I should have felt empowered. That device is my lifeline. I had to start taking a purse everywhere, which I wasn't really a fan of. But then, whenever I tried to go without it, I was bringing two EpiPens, an inhaler, and anything else I needed in my pockets. You may or may not know how small or non-existent women's pants pockets can be. I would usually drop things and it simply didn't work out. Eventually, something much better came along. I switched to AviQ as soon as I heard about it, which was shortly after it was approved by the FDA in 2012. I had to go back to EpiPens during the AviQ recall and that was a longer stint than I even had it for the first time. But as of today, AviQ and I have been happily reunited for several years. A single AVQ can fit into my women's pants pockets. Don't even get me started on the pants that don't have pockets. That's another story. It's the size of a credit card, so I can use it as a wallet. <laughs> that looks pretty weird. And a lot of people have interesting reactions to it, but I personally find it pretty convenient. I am still not a fan of purses. A good friend of mine, an industrial designer, decided to use her skills to tackle the problems with epinephrine auto-injectors head-on. After the break, I'll have a conversation with her so you can hear all about what goes into a concept design for a life-saving product. So... Why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Mary Friedel. I am a industrial designer currently at Mamatome, based out of the Cincinnati area. And I recently graduated from the University of Cincinnati, um, the DAP program in industrial design. Awesome. So 
Uh, when you were in UC's industrial design program, one of your projects was redesigning epinephrine auto injectors. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what made you want to do that project and uh, your just your thought process during it? Sure. Um, so when I was at DAP, one of my courses was a home health studio. Um, so we worked with, it was a collaborative studio, so our whole class worked with a class of nursing students and through that we were um, challenged to find projects that helped people in some way in the medical field. So after doing a lot of research I realized that there's quite a few issues with the epinephrine and how that is applied in this as a system in the United States. So like a lot of people have allergies, 51% um, of adults have had a severe allergic reaction um, of those people who have allergies and every three minutes a food allergy reaction sends someone to the ER. So allergies are obviously a big problem in the United States, but there's also an epinephrine shortage. So a lot of people don't have access to epinephrine and the way that they would need to. Um, it's super expensive. It costs like $600 for a pack of two of the EpiPens. And it's only seems to be getting worse. There's a shortage because of manufacturing delays and stuff along those lines. So it just seemed like a big problem, but then something that wouldn't be unrealistic to address. That's really important now because we're experiencing shortages of a lot of things and people are having trouble getting access to their medications, but this was going on long before that. Yeah, exactly. I think a lot of it has to do with um, the company Mylan. They have a lot of patents on the EpiPen and because of that, it sort of has made it harder for other manufacturers to produce epinephrine auto injectors because they have such a major market share. If they have an issue in manufacturing at all, then they obviously can't keep up with the production. So it's definitely a huge issue. What was it like working with the, were they nursing students or were they already professional nurses? Um, they were nursing students also. So they were in some special like accelerated program. So it was really Cool to work with them. They had a very different perspective on things than we did as designers. So it's always important to get out of your field and work cross-disciplinary and hear different perspectives when designing things like this. Yeah, I think that's really important because you want to get right to the user base. I imagine that every nurse would hopefully be trained on how to use epinephrine, even though a lot of times it's the, the victim, I guess, <laughs> administering it themselves. Yeah, I felt a little safer having her by my side when we were taking apart epinephrine auto injectors and <laughs> trying to see how they function on the inside. So um, tell us a little bit about the design that you came up with. So the design that I came up with was meant to address some of the issues that I already talked about, so regarding um, price and accessibility. But then I also had some other requirements that I wanted to incorporate in this design. So. There can sometimes be a stigma around people with allergies and carrying around an EpiPen. Some kids might not necessarily like the fact that they have to carry around an EpiPen. And there's sort of like a stigma around like, oh, that's not cool. Um, so one of the solutions that I wanted this design to be was something that the kids or adults who had to carry this device around felt more of an emotional connection to it and sort of destigmatize the fact that they have to carry it around. So something that they feel proud to carry around versus something that they would rather just leave at home. And then also another issue that I wanted to help solve with this is the fact that at every 18 months, if the user doesn't use their EpiPen, which is a good thing if they don't have to use it, it means that they haven't had a major allergic reaction, but at the same time, that's unused plastic and waste going into the landfill every 18 months. So part of my design was to decrease the amount of waste that's going into the landfills by making it a reusable auto injector. So my design has two different cartridges in the device. So it's a dual dose, meaning when people carry around the epinephrine auto injectors, they're supposed to carry around two with them in case one dose isn't enough to stop the reaction or if um, one is expired and doesn't work right or um, a multitude of reasons. But so it has two doses in this one device so they don't have to carry around two things they just carry around one and then when it's expired you just replace a little cartridge instead of throwing the whole thing away 
So my idea with that is that instead of buying a whole new pen every time, it would also reduce costs because you're not purchasing as much. Any of the like internal mechanisms in the device, you're simply replacing a cartridge with the actual like medicine in it. That's great. I mean, I don't I don't even like it cluttering up my drawer because I I've honestly never thrown one away cuz I don't know what to do with it. It has a needle in it. Um I don't feel like I can just put it in the trash. <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to. You're supposed to throw it away in a sharps container or I think sometimes hospitals will have like a a drive where they set up a tent and people can hand in their unused EpiPens or used ones, I guess. Um, you're not supposed to throw them away, but I think that's what ends up happening <laughs> in a lot of cases. I can definitely also relate to the point about the aesthetics of it. Like EpiPens, actual name brand EpiPens look kind of scary and they're huge and they're just uncomfortable to carry around. You remember the time I lost it at the Blue Jackets game, right? Oh, yeah, it fell out of your sweatshirt pocket. <laughs> <laughs> we had to go back. <laughs> so was your design inspired by any existing products? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's kind of hard to design without looking to other inspirational projects, um, but there are definitely a few. Um, I think Quip is a great example. It's not necessarily like a medical device, but it's a home health related product and they sort of took on the task of making something that you use every day just have a simple sleek design that you're proud to like have in your home. And there's a couple other ones. It's an inhaler that has bright colors and a really cool gradient and um, the guy who actually designed it also went to UC. I looked at some just very like normal things that people have with them so like an AirPods case and that's something that it's super simple, but people enjoy carrying it around with them. So I was trying to sort of mimic those kinds of forms that people feel an emotional connection to and sort of mimic that in my own design. So uh, what were the kinds of challenges that you had when you were coming up with this design? I think the biggest challenge with this was um, figuring out the technical feasibility. So whenever you have something that's medical related, it's obviously going to be used or, or not used, but in a life or death situation. So it has to work every time um, and it has to be intuitive to use because it doesn't do any good if the user doesn't know how to use it or in the heat of the moment that they get stressed out and can't figure out how to use it. So that sort of was the biggest challenge, um, especially with figuring out like the internal mechanisms. There's a lot of, a lot of moving parts and figuring out how to keep the epinephrine cartridge, be in a sterile environment where the user puts it in and it's sterile, but then is able to move around some of the like internal mechanisms to make sure that it's secure and in place and then will work properly. And they know that it will be work properly when it's time to actually use it. So that was probably the hardest challenge. Um, luckily, I had experience from some of my co-ops and also some mentors that I met along the way who were eager to like get on a zoom call with me and talk me through how some of this stuff could work and then also like check my work and make sure I was heading on the right track. So I included a little feature on my design that has it's just like a little switch that will go from red to green or um, when you put the cartridge in so if it's in the right place then it'll flip to like a little green switch but if you don't have it in right it'll be like red and notify you that you don't have it in right and that sh should always be green so in case an emergency happens you're ready to use it. Can you tell us like about some of the other designs that you've worked on? I'm um, sure so one of the other designs I worked on was another like sort of collaborative project and it was for a hospital gown for children who might have some kind of long-term or like chronic illness and would have to have some sort of like long-term stay in the hospital. Um, we found that some people probably have heard of this, but like the white coat effect where when a doctor enters the room, they become more stressed. And we found that stress works against like the healing process. So we designed this gown to that had little sensors in it that would detect their oxygen level, stress hormones, heartbeat, and um, stuff along those lines. And then if it detected through those sensors that the child was stressed then it would play music through it had these little speakers on it and then also lit up lights around a hospital room 
and it was all controlled through an app that was meant to give the child some sense of like control over their environment. Um, so we thought that it was a good solution to sort of mitigate stress in children in hospital environments. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to me today, Mary. It's good to talk to you. Thanks. Um, if people were interested in looking at my work, they can go to maryfriedel.com. M-A-R-Y-F-R-I-E-D-L.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of Modern Access. If you need any guidance about how to handle food allergies, or if you just want to learn more in support of those who have them, FAIR, that's F-A-R-E, is a good resource. You can find them at foodallergy.org. If you have a question, or if you know of any adaptive tech that you think should be featured in an episode, or if you just want to get in touch, email me at modernaccesspod at gmail.com. Or you can leave a voice message on Anchor and it might get played on the show. The easiest way to support this show is to subscribe to Modern Access wherever you listen to podcasts. Modern Access is also on Patreon. You can join and get access to behind-the-scenes content. You can also follow Modern Access Pod on social media. Modern Access is produced and hosted by me, Coach Caitlin. This show's theme music was written by Quentin Wolfe. Graphic design for Modern Access is done by Alison Menares. Thanks to you for listening.